Namaste and good morning, everyone. Let's start our Tuesday class with some prayers first. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat, Parbrahma, Tasme Shri Guru Venamaha, Om Bhur Bhavaswaha, Tatsavitravare Neyam, Bargo Deva Sedi Mahi, Dio Yo Naha Prachodaya, Astoma Sadhamia, Tamsoma Jyotir Gamia, Mrityurma Amritangamia, Om Senavatu, Senavunatu, Seviriam Tarvavai, Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu, Ma Vidvi Shavahi, Om Shanti 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 O. Let's open our Uddhav Gita books. Chapter 7, we just started last week. And Lord Krishna is speaking. And we are on verse number 3. Dharmoha Rajasthamoha Nyat Satva Vridhir Anutma Ashu Nashyati Tanmuloho Hi Adharma Ubhyehate When one follows the religious principles of goodness, that is Satvikta, this practice frees one from the influence of passion and ignorance. So that's how we rise above the Rajsikta and the Tamsikta by practicing Satvikta. When passion and ignorance are not present, then their original cause religion cannot be seen. So when the influence of passion and ignorance is vanquished, irreligion principles. Irreligion means anything opposite of dharma. You can call it a dharma. Those principles that are born of passion and ignorance are also vanquished. There is no superior quality than purified goodness, which when developed, vanquishes the qualities of passion and ignorance. When passion and ignorance are destroyed, then irreligion, which is the origin of these qualities, is also destroyed. So he is, uh, Lord Krishna is emphasizing that we should live a sattvic life. Sattvic life. Verse number four. Agamaho apa prajadeshaha kala karam chajanam chal. Dhyanam mantro atsanskaro the shayat guna etwa. Religious scriptures. Water. One's association with one's children or with the people in general. The particular place, the time, activities, birth, meditation. Chanting of mantras and purificatory rituals, these vary in quality so that by their association, the modes of nature become variously prominent. So he is telling us how with different tools, we can bring more and more sattvikta in our life. It has already been described that by eating food in the mode of goodness, one's existence becomes purified. The next two verses describe objects on the platform of goodness. The word Agam means religious scriptures. Agam. And the word Pragya means or Praja. Praja means people in general. There are three kinds of religious scriptures. Those in the mode of goodness, those in the mode of passion, and those in the mode of ignorance. The three material modes are prominent in varieties of people, water, children, time, place, action, mantras, and so on. So that means everything in this world other than the Atma and Paramatma can be sattvic, rajsik, or tamsik. 
So it's up to us uh, which one we want to choose. And he is uh, telling us to choose uh, Satvik if you want to get rid of the Rajsik and the Tamsik. Number five. Tat Tat Satvikam Eva Shama Yad Yad Vridha Prachakshate Nindantihi Tamsam Tat Tad Rajasam Tad Upekshitam among the 10 items I have just mentioned, the ones that have been praised by great sages, such as Srila Vyasadeva, are those that are sattvic or in the mode of goodness. The ones that have been condemned are those that are tamsic or in the mode of ignorance. And the ones that have been neglected are those that are rajsic or in the mode of passion. The sattvic scriptures have been glorified by the great sages. The tamsic scriptures have been criticized and the rajsic scriptures have been ignored. Meaning that they have neither been praised nor criticized. Among these ten items, the ones that are beneficial and admirable are sattvic. The ones that are obnoxious are tamsic and the ones that simply give rise to indifference are rajsic. So like a rajsic in between sattvic the highest and tamsic definitely known. Okay. Number six. Sattvika nehe ev se vet puman sattva vivridhe Tataha dharmas tatatanam yavat samritir apohanam. Until one attains the platform of self realization and is thus able to give up his illusory identification with the gross and subtle bodies, which is caused by the three modes of nature, he should cultivate the mode of goodness. So that means we got to do the sadhana. To bring more and more sattvikta in us. We got to pay attention. We got to work towards it. When one's quality of goodness is enhanced, religious principles can be practiced, leading to an awakening of one's transcendental understanding. So one should study those scriptures that are in the mode of goodness and therefore prescribe detachment from sense gratification and mental speculation. <clears throat> One should not <clears throat> study the Rajsik and Tamsik scriptures that propagate the paths of sense gratifications and athe <clears throat> atheism by means of religious rituals and impersonal philosophy. One should bathe and quench his thirst with pure water and remain aloof from contaminated water in the form of perfume and wine. One should associate with those who are cultivating detachment from this material world and give up the association of those who aspire for material enjoyment and who are sinful. One should reside in a solitary place in the association of devotees. One should not be attracted to gambling in casinos or bars. One should worship the Supreme Lord during auspicious time of Brahma Mahurata and avoid the sinful influence of the middle of the night. One should consciously perform these prescribed duties and pious activities should never be performed with a desire to fulfill one's lusty ambitions or to give trouble to others. One should receive an initiation mantra from a bona fide spiritual master and not take initiation into the chanting of insignificant shakt mantras. One should meditate on the supreme personality of Godhead and his pure devotees and not on lusty women and envious men. Following the example of Lord Chaitanya, one should chant the holy names of the Lord and not songs that glorify the bondage of lust between men and women. 
purificatory rituals should be accepted for the purpose of actual purification and not for the purpose of achieving material blessings. When one tries to cultivate the mode of goodness by following the principles of religion, transcendental knowledge will awaken within the heart. This knowledge consists of the eternal nature of the individual spirit, soul, and the supreme personality of Godhead. Such knowledge frees one from the bodily concept of the life and thus destroys the material designations that cover the conditioned souls. This is the path to eternal life. So this is the reason we want to follow Satvik path. One who diligently remains aloof from the influence of passion and ignorance can enhance the quality of goodness. Only in this way can one achieve real knowledge and thereby free oneself from the gross and subtle designations that cover his pure existence. Okay, we'll move towards a Satvikta only we if we, we are aware of what Rajsik and Tamsik is, sir. it's not going to happen automatically. We have to make an effort. Make an effort. Verse number seven. Venuhu sangharshaha jo vahani dagdwa shamyati tadvannam evam gun vyatyehe jo deha shamyati tat kriya when fire is produced from the friction of bamboos in the forest, it burns the source of its birth, the bamboo forest. Because fire was born from the bamboos, so it destroys the bamboos also, the whole forest. Thus the fire is calmed by its own action. Similarly, the gross and subtle bodies of the living entities are created by the interactions of the material modes of nature. If one uses his gross and subtle body to cultivate knowledge of the self, then such enlightenment destroys the influence of the material modes of nature. Thus, like the fire, the body and mind are pacified by their own actions in destroying the source of their birth. So he's giving us this analogy over here, the bamboo forest with the fire. The term gun jaha indicates that the body is generated by the competition of the three modes of material nature, which exist everywhere in constantly changing proportions. As fire produced by the friction of bamboo sticks burns a fire, and then becomes extinguished, the gross and subtle bodies, which are generated by the interaction of the modes of material nature, become pacified when the influence of the modes of nature is destroyed. Because we got to let go of these bodies. Sir. Whether it's a gross body or a subtle body or a causal body, we have been thickening and thickening these bodies, sir. And we have forgotten who we are. So when we detach from all of it, so burning really means detachment. When we detach from these bodies, what is left behind? Our real self, the Atma. And that's what we need to realize. That's what we need to experience. Now Uddhav is saying something in the verse number 8. Vidanti Marteha Prayen Vishyan Padam Aptan Tathapi Bhunjate Krishna Tathkatam Shwa Rajvat Shri Uddhav said, Human beings can generally understand that material life ultimately avoids great misery, but still they try to enjoy it as much as they can. We can all relate to that. Because part of us know that. Still we get engrossed into it. My dear Lord Krishna, how can a person who possesses general knowledge act just like a dog or a donkey? 
So that means uh, we know the knowledge, but still we act like an animal. Why? So due to the absence of uh, foresight, uh, dogs, asses, and goats put themselves into great danger. A dog steals food at the risk of being beat, beaten or killed, and he often uh, approaches a bitch for sex, even though she bears her teeth and snarls, threatening him with severe injury. An ass produces a female ass for sex simply to be kicked by her hind legs. He carries a heavy burden all day long simply for a little grass that is available everywhere. A goat is being taken to the slaughterhouse and yet even in that situation, he happily approaches a female goat for sex. Similarly, most human beings, being without the understanding that the acts of sense gratifications are the very causes of their suffering, indulge themselves without restriction. Uddhava wants to know why human beings are generally mad after sense gratification, even when they know that it will simply cause them miseries in the future. So even knowing something is wrong, we still end up doing it. So what, let's see what Lord Krishna is saying to answer Uddhav's question over here. Verse number 9 and 10, they are together. Aham iti anyatha buddhi paramatasya yatha hridi utasarpatihi rajogoram tatavekarim manah rajo yuktasya manasaha sankalpa savikalpaha tatakamo gunadhyanad duhusah syad dhi durmate the Supreme Lord said, O Uddha, an ignorant person falsely identifies himself with the material body and mind. So in other words, the problem is identification. We forget who we are and we start thinking that we are the body and the mind. In this consciousness, the mood of passion, which simply causes distress, overwhelms the mind which is born of the mode of goodness. The mind under the influence of the mode of passion functions by accepting and rejecting things in the hopes of making material advancement. As a result, by constantly thinking of the products of the modes of material nature, a foolish person becomes afflicted with unbearable material longings. Okay. So, in other words, we forget who we are and we think that we are just this body, just this mind. And we just fall into the trap. The Supreme Lord says, those who, th who thirst for sense gratification cannot be called learned men. Okay, Because Uddhav said the learned men. So Lord Krishna is saying, no, they are not learned. Although they think of themselves as very intelligent, the process by which one is helplessly bound in illusion is clearly described herein. The words sankalpaha, servikalpaha, in this verse indicate that materialistic people are continually making plans in the hopes of attaining happiness and avoiding suffering. Any sane person must admit that in spite of all such plans, material life is simply full of miseries. The mind is a creation of the mode of goodness. And thus, it is not meant for absorption in attempts to fulfill the animalistic propensities which are impelled by the lower modes of passion and ignorance. So we should always remember that we are not the body, mind. We are the Atma. That's the only way. Because we got to be aware of it. We got to consciously. First we have to try, but then it becomes our nature. Then it's easy. Verse number 11. Karoti kam vashgaha karmanyahe avijitendriyaha dukhordhkarnihi sampashyam rajoveg vimohita. 
one who fails to control his senses comes under the control of material desires and is thus bewildered by the strong waves of the mode of passion. Such a person performs material activities with great enthusiasm, although he clearly sees that the result will be future unhappiness. So controlling the senses, that is the very first thing. We want to control our mind, but mind is so subtle. Subtle thing, definitely hard to control. We got to start controlling the grosser thing. Okay? I always give you the example of the ice and the water. Ice, the block of ice, easy to control. That is grosser. When it becomes water, it will keep on flowing, hard to control. But when it becomes a steam, the vapors, it's even harder. So that's why the sadhana really starts controlling the senses. Pratyahara. Okay. Or dhamma. Control your senses. Okay. Then mind will be controlled slowly. Okay. So that's what he says. One who fails to control his senses comes under the control of material desires. Okay, so you got to nip it at the butt, as they say. In the hopes of increasing his material enjoyment, a person of uncontrolled senses performs many activities, although he knows very well that they will ultimately bring him misery. Being driven by material desires, materialistic people, who are controlled by their senses, invite unlimited distress. Because sky is the limit. For the desires also and for the distress also. Verse number 12. Rajas tamobhya yad api vidvan vikshipt dhipunah atindrataho mano yunjan dosh drishtir na sanjate when the mind of an intelligent person is disturbed by the modes of passion and ignorance, he should carefully control his mind. So that means the sooner we get hold of it, better it is. By clearly seeing the contamination of the modes of nature, he does not become attached. So as soon as we can get to it, we should. Even in the worldly things also, when something has spilled on a clean surface, it's easier to clean it right away than just let it sit there. The same thing happens with the mind also. If it becomes contaminated, clean it. Don't wait. Don't wait. So even though learned people are sometimes disturbed by the modes of passion and ignorance coming under their control, they do not become attached due to understanding the inauspicious consequences. Okay? So this goes because we are all householders. This goes in our relationship also. Anywhere there's a little disturbance, just move, remove that misunderstanding right away. The sooner we do, the better it is. There will be calmness in the mind. Although a learned person's mind may become disturbed because of its nature of accepting and rejecting the things of this world, because he knows that he will incur sin if he indulges in acts of passion and ignorance, he does not allow himself to be deviated from his religious life. Verse number 13, and still Lord Krishna is answering that little question and a doubt in Uddhav's mind. Pramataho nu yunjit mano mai arpiyan chane nirvanaho yatha kalam jit shwaso jitasanaha one should be attentive and grave and never indolent or depressed. 
while diligently practicing the yoga procedures of breathing and sitting postures, one should practice fixing the mind on me at dawn, noon, and sunset. In this way, the mind will gradually become absorbed in me. So he's telling us that spend some time controlling your breath by doing pranayama. Learn to sit still, calm, and fix your mind, which mind which just goes into the world, bring it back towards the Atman Parmatma. That's all he's saying, which we are all familiar with. The word Atyendritaha means cautious. One should never be diverted by sense gratification. Where should one fix his mind? The Supreme Lord is here in giving the answer on me. Okay, because we always wonder where should we put the mind on God? If one is unable to fix the mind on the Lord in the beginning, don't be discouraged, but continue one's practice to gradually make advancement. Those who are trying to absorb their minds in thought of the Supreme Lord, Supreme Lord should give up all desires for enjoying the objects of the external world. They should remain enthusiastically engaged in the service of the Lord while practicing asans, pranayam, and so on. So all these techniques to take care of the body are ultimately are to bring our mind on God. That's why the advanced yoga asana is also, it's not if we can stand on our head for hours, no. If we can keep our mind while taking care of the body, keep our mind on the God. That is the advancement. Okay? So verse number 14. Eta van yog adishta ho mach shiye sankadi bhi sarvato man akrishye mai adva veshyate yatha. The actual yoga system as taught by my devotees headed by Sanak Kumar can be summarized in these few words. After withdrawing the mind from all other objects, one should completely absorb it in me without a deviation. Okay, so this is the gist of the whole sadhana. Mind which likes to run into every which way, bring it back on God. Keep on practicing. Sure, it will run away. Bring it back. Just like we train a puppy, a baby, the same way we got to train our mind. Mind. Now, Uddhav says, Yadatvam sanakadi bhyo yoyen rupen keshav yogam adishtvan etad rupam ichami vedutam so Uddhav said, okay, Shiva, I would like to know when and in what form did you instruct the science of yoga to the sages headed by Sanak? And Sanak is who? Brahma ji is son. Sanak, Sanak, Sanandan, Sanatan, if you remember those names. And Sanak. So he is showing interest because Lord Krishna mentioned the Sanak name, headed by Sanak Kumar. Okay. So now Lord Krishna is saying, Utraha Hiranyagar Basse Manasa Sanakadya O Prachu Pitram Suksham Yogasse Kanti Kim Gatima. The Supreme Lord said, once the sage is headed by Sanak, who were born from the mind of Brahma, inquired from him about the difficult subject matter of the goal of yoga. So even for the great rishis, they ponder upon it because this is a difficult subject, goal of yoga. So the phrase, Ayakantikam, 
Gatima means the un ultimate goal. See, I, we always talk about it. Sure, there are goals in life. Throughout our life, we have seen the goals. Pass this exam. Pass this. Get the degree. Get married. Have children. Marry them. Those are all the small goals. But ultimate goal. What is the ultimate goal? We should always remember. And that's what Lord Krishna is talking about. That Sanakadi, those Kumars wanted to know the ultimate goal of Yoda. What did the Sanakadi say? So this is verse number 17. Guneshva avishteha cheta Gunash cheta sicha prabhu Katham anyone sanatyago Mumukshor Ati Titirisho. The sage is headed by the Sanak said, My dear Lord, the minds of human beings are naturally attracted towards the objects of sense gratification. And the sense objects enter the mind in the form of material desires. Considering this, how can a person who desires liberation, who wants to desist from the activities of sense gratification, sever the mutual tie between the sense objects and the mind? Please explain this to us. Okay. So the mind, he says that mind put it through into God. But the mind, through the desires, runs after the objects. How can we break this tie? The sons of Brahma said to their father, human beings are naturally attached to sense gratification. And this attachment is firmly rooted within their minds. How is it possible for a person who wishes to conquer the urges for material enjoyment to cut off the relationship between the sense objects and the mind? An intelligent person must understand that as long as he remains conditioned by material nature, the modes of nature will constantly disturb him with the enticements for sense gratification. If one falls victim to such allurements, the perfection of life will remain unachieved. And it's not just one sense we have. We have eyes also, nose also, ears also, taste words also, touch also. So many of them. How can we control them? Lord Krishna said, Evam prishto ho mahadeva sunabhur bhut bhavnaha dhyayaman prashan bijam nabhya padhyat karamadhi. The Supreme Lord said, My dear Uddhava, Brahma who is born from my body and who is the creator of the living entities within this material world being the best among the demigods that's the devtas seriously considered how to answer the question of his sons headed by Sanak. The intelligence of Brahma however was affected by his activities of creation and so he could not discover the essential answer to their question. See, sometimes when we are busy actively doing something, we can also find ourselves not answering some deep questions. Haven't we done that to our children? When they were little, they come and bother us. Don't do that. This is not the right time. And this is what Brahma is saying. The Supreme Lord said, Brahma is the best among the demigods and the creator of the living beings. And yet, even after much consideration, he could not understand the actual answer of the question placed before him by his sons. This was due to the fact that his intelligence had been affected by his activities of creation. Activities of creation. So when we are actively involved, what happens? There's a lot of Rajsikta which were performed with material 
attachment. Because of being attached to his activities of creation, Prajapati the creator of the living entity, continuation of this verse number 19. Sa maam achintriyata devaha prashan parati tirshiha se aham hansarupena sa kasham agmam tada. Brahma wanted to find out the answer to the questions that was puzzling him. And so he meditated on me. At that time, I appeared before him in my form as Hans. So this is a Hans form. There is no limitation on God. So Hans of that. The Supreme Lord said, while thinking over the answer to his son's question, Brahma absorbed his mind in meditation upon me. Just to show him mercy, I revealed myself to Brahmas by appearing before him in my form as Hans. As the Hans or Swan is able to separate milk from water, I appear to separate Brahma's intelligence from the modes of material nature. Being unable to answer the question of Sanak, Brahma began to meditate on the Supreme Lord. At that time, the Lord assumed the form of Hans and appeared before Brahma. Brahma then inquired from Hans about his identity. Drishtvaha mamata upavrajyahe kritavapad abhivandhanam Brahmanam agrata kritva pa prachu ko bhavan iti. This is verse number 20. Upon seeing my form as Hansa, the sages headed by Sanak, placing Brahmas in the lead. So now there are four Kumars and their father, Brahma also, approached me and worshipped my lotus feet. Then they asked me, Who are you? Because he appeared there, Brahma just thought about him, meditated on him, and God appeared. And they all went to him and prostrated. And that is the way to approach the Guru. Iti aham muni bhi prishtam tat jagyasu me, my dear Uddhava. The sages were eager to understand the actual purpose of yoga and so they inquired from me. Listen attentively as I repeat my instructions to the sages. So he doesn't want us to forget that this conversation is going on between Lord Krishna and Uddhava. And he is repeating what he told Brahma and his sons also. What is the purpose of yoga is, what the purpose of life is. Verse number 22. My dear Brahman sir, if you believe that I am also a Jeev soul, and that there is no ultimate difference between us because all souls are ultimately one without individuality. Your question does not seem relevant because the spirit and soul has no designations such as caste. On what basis should I answer your question? The Hans incarnation said, my dear Brahmans, you ask me, who are you? Because you consider me to be a living entity like yourselves. Do you think that I possess a material body? Or do you think that I am the Supreme Lord? If you consider me to be a living entity, then as a pure spirit soul, 
On what basis can I distinguish myself from you? So at the soul level, we are the same. There is no difference between us. Sir. One soul to the other. How could you ask me such a question? So that Hans of Thar is saying that it's an absurd question when you ask me, who are you? If there is no difference between the Supreme Lord and the living entities, then there is also oneness of the person who is questioning and the person who is answering. Who should ask a question and to whom? The actual purport of Lord Hans's statement is that the spirit and soul and the super soul are separate identities. Verse number 23. Panchatma keshu ho bhuteshu samaneshu cha vastuta o bhavan itiva prashna ho vacharam ho ki anarthaka. If when you asked me, who are you? You are referring to the material body, which is made of the five gross material elements, earth, water, fire, air and ether. You should have asked, who are you five? If you consider that basically all material bodies are the same, being made of the same elements, then your question cannot be taken seriously. Thus, it appears that in asking my identity, you are simply speaking words without any real meaning. So in the previous verse, the Lord indicated that if the sages accepted the impersonal philosophy, that all living beings are ultimately one, then the question, who are you, made no sense. In this verse, the Lord rejects the false conception that the self is the material body, which is composed of five gross material elements. The sages might argue that even among learned persons, it is a matter of courtesy to ask questions and give answers. After all, the Lord had addressed them as Brahmins and thus had also acted according to social conventions. To answer this argument, the Lord says, my addressing you as Brahmins would have no meaning if we are ultimately one. I merely reciprocated with your way of speaking to me if we are ultimately one, then neither of our statements has any meaning. The absolute truth is one, but a living entity's material body, which is made of the five gross material elements, is different from other material bodies. The sages had already seen their father worship the lotus feet of the Lord. And so there was no need for their question. <clears throat> Verse number 24. Manasaha, vachasaha, drishteha, grihate, anyer, api indriye, aham evna mato neyad, iti buddhye dhum. Anjasaha, whatever is perceived by the mind and senses is nothing but a manifestation of me. Okay, This should be understood by an unbiased examination of the truth. The Lord here explains that since everything is the expansion of his potency, he is not different from anything. Nothing can exist separately from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And thus everything shares in the Lord's nature. The Supreme Lord is one without a second. Therefore, whatever one perceives with his eyes and other senses must be considered in relationship with the Supreme Lord. That's why we say that this Maya is Bhagwan Ki Maya. It's not somebody else's maya. It's God's maya. Let's do one more verse and we'll stop it, even though I know you would like to continue, but the clock tells me that we have to stop. So, number 25. Guneshva avishtehe chetoho gunash chetsi chabragyaha jivasye dehe ubhiyam gunash cheto mad atmanaha My dear sons, 
the mind has the propensity to enter into material sense objects and material sense objects enter into the mind. However, both the mind and the material sense objects are designations that cover the pure spirit soul. Who is my eternal part and parcel? So that means the Atma is covered with these Upadhis. The mind and the senses also. The sons of Brahma thought, my dear Lord, if we are unintelligent, you definitely stated that everything is a manifestation of you alone because everything is the expansion of your potency. It thus appears that there is an intimate relationship between the mind and the objects of the sense. We simply want to ascertain how the mind can be detached from the objects of the senses. And please be merciful and enlighten us. The Lord replied, my dear sons, what you say is very true. Although the living entities are my eternal parts and parcels, in conditioned life they artificially identify with the mind and thus become attracted to enjoy the objects of the senses. As long as the soul identifies with the mind, desires for sense gratification will continue to harass him. But because the mind and sense objects actually have no connection with the soul, they should be rejected. In this way, one can become free from the dualities of material existence. See, that's why the detachment is important. Okay, it's not that we should, while we are living in this body, we should not eat or we should not wear clothes or we should not have this and that. But we should not get attached to it. The conditioned living entities in the material world are under the control of the three modes of material nature. Whereas the Supreme Personality of Godhead, being eternally liberated, is transcendental to the three modes of material nature. Material sense objects enter into the minds of the conditioned living entities and their minds run after the material sense objects. So let's stop it here with the verse number 25 and we'll start next week from here. Because the story continues and we are all interested in knowing what Lord is saying in that avatar. Om Purnamada Purnamadat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadai Purnam Eva Visheshate Om Shanti 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 Om Thank you very much. Namaste Guruji. Namaste.